So the title of my research is Development of a Practical Curriculum for Ancient Chinese Medical Literature, a Modified Delphi Approach to the Huang DNA Chain. And so I thought it would be appropriate to start a lecture about research into Nanjing with a quote from Nanjing. So I picked this one. Yin and Yang are the Tao of heaven and earth, the fundamental principles of everything, the father and mother of myriad variations the root of life and death, and the palace of spirit brightness. To treat disease, one must follow the root. That's from Suen chapter 5. Uh, the reason why I picked this quote is because I think in these two sentences, it exemplifies what makes the Nanjing such an important text. On the surface, it's quite simple. They're talking about yin and yang, treating the root of the disease. But it's also incredibly deep, because in these two sentences, it literally defines what it is to become a practitioner of Chinese medicine or East Asian medicine and practice the medicine. It's about understanding yin and yang, understanding the flow of heaven and earth, the energetic cycles, and then using that as a means to treat disease. Before I get into the problem, I just want to give you a little bit of background on why I chose to do this topic. Um, I went to a school where the Nanjing was required as part of the curriculum. And when I first got exposure to the Nanjing, that's when my excitement and enthusiasm for Chinese medicine really just took off. And so it has a special place in my heart because it, it stoked my own passion for Chinese medicine. And as Dr. G mentioned in the introduction, the Nanjing is the fundamental text for not only Chinese medicine, but really all of East Asian medicine. So with that sort of background, you can imagine that for me, it's sort of an issue that only 51% of American schools of East Asian medicine are teaching the Nanjing in their curriculum. And you might look at that and say, well, that's slightly over 50%. What's the problem there? To me, the problem is that of these schools, 68% of them are teaching the Nanjing as part of a broader class. And when I say that, what I mean is it would be part of a class on Chinese history, the history and philosophy of Chinese medicine, or something like a survey of the classics or an intro to the classics, where you're only spending maybe two or three weeks getting into the Nanjing. You can't really get in, in, in depth with it. Perhaps even more disturbing is that only 10% of all East Asian medicine schools in the U.S. teach the Nanjing as a required class. So when you look at those two statistics together, the reason why I see it as a problem is because we are not necessarily graduating students that will be capable of teaching the Nanjing to future generations. And the other challenge of the Nanjing, and, and this is something that I would incredibly grateful to my teacher, uh, Yanjong Ju, who goes by Kevin Ju at Five Branches. He didn't, a, a lot of students, I think, um, Western students get daunted because they, he, they start to think the only way they can approach the Nanjing is if they read Chinese. And that's an incredibly daunting prospect for most American students. And what my teacher used to say was, Really, to understand the Nanjing, we have to get in the mindset of the people that wrote the Nanjing. It's not necessarily the language, but an understanding of the context in which the Nanjing was a part. Because the Nanjing was actually part of a, like a cultural flourishing that happened roughly 2,000 years ago. A, just a huge intellectual explosion where the majority of classic Chinese books were written, not just the medical books. So the goal of my research was to create a practical, consensus-based curriculum for the Huang Di Nanjing. Um, pretty basic goal. So for the literature for this study, what I looked at was English translations of the Nanjing. Again, we are, this curriculum is designed for American students, so the vast majority of them do not read Chinese. And truthfully, with the exception of the native Chinese that are still teaching in the United States, most Western teachers don't read Chinese. So we need to utilize English translations. It's, it's just sort of a necessity. 
Secondly, I looked at foundational sources of Chinese culture. So things like the I Ching, or the Tao Te Ching, uh, the writings of Confucius, things that were part of this intellectual flourishing at which time the Nanjing was written. I looked at modern scholarship, people like Nathan Sivan, uh, John Major, other well-known academics that read Chinese and translate Chinese and then give commentary in their area, whether it's um, as a historian, as a philosopher, as a religious scholar. That was another piece that I looked at. Then I looked at teaching strategies. And for this, I was in sort of a bind because there really hasn't been a lot of research done on how to teach Chinese medicine. And in particular, this is the only research I know of that tried to look at how do we teach the name Jing. So what I ended up having to do was, I was lucky enough to find a book that was written by Western professors who were teaching the Tao Te Ching in their classrooms. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that, that the Tao Te Ching is a very foundational book for Chinese philosophy and Chinese culture. So it made sense to me, well, whatever these teachers are talking about in terms of teaching the Tao Te Ching can probably be applied to the Neijin because it's such a foundational book for Chinese medicine. So it's basically an edited work with different teachers writing chapters on how they approach the Tao Te Ching in their class. The other book I looked at was um, called Transmission of Chinese Medicine, which is by Elizabeth Shu, the Chinese academic, not the Hollywood actress. <laughs> and this book was really interesting because she looked at the different styles of transmission of Chinese medicine, whether it was sort of master to student, and then the evolution into the more TCM-based education that we see today. I also looked at curriculum design models. And uh, as my title suggests, I use a modified Delphi method. And I'll get into what the Delphi is in a moment. But in terms of curriculum design, I looked at uh, curriculum design for a curriculum of hematology for Australian sports medicine physicians and the development of a curriculum for students of emergency medicine, which basically queried a group of experts as to what are the most important anatomical structures for people that are in the field of emergency medicine to know. And that's a little bit more about how the Delphi works. Um, online course catalogs were another thing that I just sort of looked through by, by virtue of the research. So online course catalogs at American schools of East Asian medicine. So, what were the research questions I was trying to answer? Number one, which schools are teaching the Neijing as part of their curriculum? Two, in what capacity is the Neijing being taught? Is it a requirement? Is it an elective? Or does it fall under other, which I sort of mentioned before as that broader class, Chinese history and philosophy, or um, introduction to the classics, something like that. Third, who are the teachers? at the schools that teach this. These are going to be my subject matter experts, my content experts on the curriculum development. And fourth, the, the major question of the research, what do current classroom teachers of the Neijing believe to be the most relevant chapters for master's level students of East Asian medicine? That was the primary question that I was asking. So, as I mentioned, I have employed a modified Delphi. and. The Delphi was started at the Rand Corporation in Santa Monica. And the way I usually explain it to people is that the Delphi is sort of like a virtual think tank. So you identify experts in a given area, on a given topic, and you survey those experts through multiple rounds in order to achieve coherence on a topic. Um, so in the case of the curriculum that I mentioned before, for um, the emergency medicine students, what are the most ana um, important anatomical structures? They asked that question to experts who would have been teachers that teach emergency medicine. They got their feedback after the first round, and then they sent out, okay, these are the 10 most uh, cited anatomical structures. Now tell me what, rank these in order. Then they sent it back, and, and it's, it's this, process that typically involves multiple iterations. Um, I'm going to get into a little bit more why I had to modify my approach, but this is a traditional Delphi. 
I, as I said, I also looked at online catalogs from ACOM accredited schools. ACOM is the, the body, the national body that accredits all schools of East Asian medicine, their acupuncture programs, their master's programs, their doctorate programs. Um, so I had to look at those catalogs in order to find which ones actually teach the Nijing. And then I gathered contact information for the contact, content experts. Those were the teachers at those schools that taught the Nijing. I emailed them in the summer of 2013 because as a former teacher myself, I felt I didn't want to get lost in the middle of a semester asking teachers to, to give me information and participate in their survey. So the question that I asked them was, can you please identify for me, in your experience, what are the most ten, what are the ten most relevant chapters for master's level students of the NJ? Now my results. 25 schools were identified for participation in the study. That, that was the 51% that I mentioned before. And I should make a side note that in order to avoid skewing the data, I only picked one teacher for a school that has multiple campuses. So like PCOM, PCOM has San Diego, Chicago, and New York. So I focused on the primary campus or the original campus, which would be PCOM San Diego. I did that because I felt that if, if I surveyed multiple teachers from the same general institution, it's likely that there's going to be very similar uh, goals for the class and syllabi for the class. So I didn't want to avoid skewing the data by doing that. So I just picked one um, of each. There are 25 schools identified. I called them all. Of those schools, I got 19 contacts for teachers. Of those 19, Eight teachers provided a full response and four abstained. Um, truthfully, the most common ex reason for abstention from the research was the legendary status of the Neijing. And this is something that we're up against. It's, it's, it's a challenge for us because the Neijing is so legendary, not only amongst practitioners of Chinese medicine, but in particular, even you know, elders of Chinese medicine from China uh, are, are reticent to weigh in on this subject because it's like, you know, asking scholars to weigh in on the, on the Bible or something like that. It's, it's so important. And, and so the majority reason cited for abstention was, I don't feel like I can break the Neijing down into ten important chapters. To me, the irony of this is that everyone is teaching the Neijing in a, in a reductionist approach at this point. Nobody's teaching the full name Jing. There's 162 chapters, and as much as I'd love to see a school someday that goes through every, every chapter throughout the course of the program, nobody's doing that. So we had four abstentions. Um, the total response rate, 12 out of 19, is 64%. And as I mentioned, I had to modify the Delphi from a traditional approach, because I only got one response to my second round Delphi. Luckily for me, that didn't affect the bulk of my data because I was able to get 10 chapters from that first round of the Delphi, which had very strong coherence. They had three or more uh, votes from, from, from the people that I surveyed. Um, there were an additional 11 chapters that received two or more votes, and that's what I sent out in the second round Delphi. 11 of these chapters received two or two votes, could you please rank these in terms of importance? Only one person got back to me on that. 